over the next few minutes, you're, you're going to discover that I'm not a particularly good public speaker. Um, I'm pretty bad at it. So, but I, I wish I was good at it. And, and I was in my hotel room watching all these YouTube clips of great stand-up comedians. And as a data scientist, I found myself taking notes. And I found that 85% of them um, open their act with audience interaction. So how are you all doing? <laughs> Check. OK. Well, we're off to a good start. <laughs> so around uh, 10 years ago, I, I was at Intel in the US. Um, and basically, some friends of mine, or colleagues, rather, we were sitting in a white, white room, uh, whiteboard room with a lot of coffee on a lunch break, kind of procrastinating. And, and we came up with this idea for a new technology Intel wasn't using that it had acquired years ago. And we thought, oh my gosh, we could build a whole new business for Intel using this technology. And, and wouldn't that be awesome? And we were imagining this utopia where we could play entrepreneur and get all the excitement and the you know, multidisciplinary exposure of, of a startup, but we'd have the safe paycheck and job security of a big multinational. So we, uh, yeah, some of you in the room, we, we thought we'd have the best of both possible worlds. I think you can already see where this is going. Uh, so we raised millions of dollars in the group. Uh, for the group, we got set up under a special incubation group that Intel had at the time. Um, and we built the team out to over 30 people over the next year. And we started selling and commercializing and building this new technology. And we, we're getting sore from patting ourselves on the back because it was going really well. And then one day, basically some nice people from corporate said, hey, great project. We love what you're doing. Amazed by the progress. Uh, we're getting out of communications which is the industry we were in. Um, so he said, so no more funding, but you've done an amazing job, and we wish you all the best. Right? So, so we said, whoa, whoa, go, go back to the part about our funding. And uh, our, our project basically was being cut. And the, the decision for Intel to get out of communications had nothing to do with our group. We were this little speck on the radar. But the downstream effect of that was we were no longer strategic, whereas about a year and a half ago, we were extremely strategic. And, and we all know that's, I know this never happens at your companies. But you've probably heard that it happens at other companies. So you know, I think that was a particularly traumatic experience for me at the time, because uh, you know, what we had done with this idea, and we'd had these blood oaths by all these senior executives that they would support this project, that it was strategic, that they'd go the distance. And we had recruited our team. A lot of people were, were people from the core who we had a high opinion of. You know, they had core safe jobs inside of Intel's proper core business. And we went out there and enticed them to join this exciting new growth project. And they were all, I mean, a lot of them, especially this is a decade ago, a lot of them were older than me. They had kids in college. You know, these were people that reminded me of my own dad. And, and we convinced them to, to leave that security for this, this project. Um, and then here we are, all of a sudden, telling them that they're going to basically were losing their jobs. right? And so I felt. In some ways, I really felt like the company had made a liar out of me. And not necessarily intentionally, but you know, you feel like an idiot when you're telling people, oh yeah, I know I swore till I was blue in the face that you would be safe here, but that turns out not to be the case. So really, that the, the anger, I was so pissed off by that experience that it ended up, the fumes of that catap you know, catapulted the next decade of my career. So I'll, I'll tell you how we went from that moment to the one we're at right now. Uh, we, we did get the group spun out and acquired by our competitor. That saved about a dozen of the jobs. Uh, everybody else basically lost their job. And I found myself um, still at Intel and fuming about this experience. And I thought, I wonder how often when companies like Intel or Intel, you know, how often do these new projects make it or not? How often do these acquisitions or new product launches succeed? How often do they fail? And I expected the gray-haired wise colleagues to just know the number. I expect, oh, yes, well, you know, when we do these projects, we succeed 20% or whatever the number was. And I quickly realized nobody had any idea uh, what the success rate was. In other words, what's the batting average? And I realized that that's, that's a huge problem because billions and billions of dollars are spent in venture capital, in partnerships with startups, uh, new product launches, acquisitions, all this innovation activity, and nobody actually knew what the success rate was. So as a data scientist, I just thought that was nuts, right? Because how can we possibly know if we're getting better or worse if we don't even know how good we are in the first place, right? So it, it blew my mind. 
that the people were doing this all the time and never stopped to ask how it's working or even measure it um, the way I wanted to measure it. So without telling my new boss, I started to very stealthily creep around the company and, and built a database over a period of months of all the product launches Intel had done over a prior 12 years and, and all the venture capital investments I could get my hands on and all the acquisitions. And I started to secretly put it into a database and start to look for patterns because I thought, first, I just want to know how often we succeed. Second of all, could we use data science to figure out a better way uh, to allocate capital at Intel? And it, what I found changed my life and I found it basically by accident. I realized after months of putting together the data, that was the hard part, very quickly running some analyses, the, the variables that we looked for, the clues about businesses that we focused on when we, our investment committees made decisions. Um, oh, I'll get that in a second. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm good. We may not get through the slides, but I don't think you'll mind. Um, so the, I'm still mad, so you can tell, right? Okay, so this is my time, okay? You're just sitting here to listen. Um, <laughs> You're cheaper than a therapist. OK. So uh, basically, uh, the variables we focused on at Intel weren't statistically correlated with outcomes. It, they just weren't. Uh, and all the typical stuff like, how good is the team? What's their track record? Who are the co-investors? You know, is this business model transformation? All those big, you know, is the market big enough? All that stuff just, it was white noise. It wasn't statistically meaningful or predictive. I'll put it that way. But there were these other variables that we certainly knew, we just didn't think about very hard for very long, and, and they were much more predictive than we ever would have imagined. And it wasn't like they, you know, so I realized we're looking at the wrong things. And if we start looking at these other things, we're not talking about a 5% or even a you know, 2 or a 10% increase in the, in the success rate of these investments, which would have been a career maker, by the way, right? A company like that, you save 1%, you just ride it. It's like tenure, right? You just, you never get fired. You can always point back to that time in the 90s when you saved the company 1%. Um, but we're talking two, three, four, five x better returns than we would have had if we looked at different variables. So this was really exciting. But I still hadn't told my boss. And I knew I would have to eventually, but I didn't want to tell my boss I'd been sneaking around and doing this if the work um, had flaws. So Intel had non-disclosure agreements with a bunch of great universities in the States. Uh, under the banner, um, the, you know, the, the proprietary of those agreements, I shared my data with a lot of professors and I invited a lot of feedback because I didn't want to take it upstairs if I was going to be made a fool of. And they really did help and we, we did improve the models and it really did hold together. And this one professor, um, he meant, you know, Clayton Christensen at Harvard, the disruptive innovation guy, had spent a, a very generous amount of time looking through my data with me. And he looked up from the table in Boston and said, hey, what are you doing this year? And I said, well, you know, I have a job. I, I didn't understand the question. He said, well, look, can I talk you into coming to Harvard for a year? Let's get you an office right by mine, and, and let's bring Harvard's resources into this research you're doing. Because it's very interesting, but the criticism is it's only one company's data. So we don't even know if this applies, or is this just a back test? You know, is this really applicable, or is it just, you know, an oddity of one particular database? So, I had this invitation to go to Harvard, and Harvard agreed basically to pay for half of it if I could get Intel to pay for the other half. And now I had to tell my boss, and I, I sort of you know, sat down with him in another whiteboard room and, and told him what I'd been doing. And I figured he'd either fire me or fund me, so 50-50. Um, and you know, he was, he was really cool about it. I was surprised. He, he was like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm like, oh. You know, and I, he was a Harvard alum. Maybe that's why. But I don't know. But I was like, well, I should have told you a long time ago. <laughs> but, um, so went off and did that, and while I was at Harvard, we, we, we really did push the research, and I'm going to share a lot of the breakthroughs we've had here in the next few minutes. But the way the story continues is Clayton Christensen was on the board of a bank called Hambricht & Company, which is an investment bank in San Francisco. Uh, Bill Hambricht, the founder, is one of the most legendary investors in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, he did Apple and Google and Genentech and Salesforce and Adobe and Amazon. I mean, you, know, you name it, and he was in the deal. He talks about, oh, yeah, I remember when I gave Steve some money. It's like, Steve Jobs? He's like, yeah, Steve. I'm like, oh, I've read about that guy. You know, it's, um, so Bill Hambrick knew Clay Christensen, and, and, and that introduction was made. And after working with me for a while, uh, Bill said, look, anytime you want to leave Intel, we would love you to come to Hambrick Ventures, and let's start using this computing system to screen our deals, and effectively become the first quantitative venture capital firm the world had ever seen. Um, 
And I was very flattered and I really wanted to say yes, but I had an obligation to go back to Intel for a while because they had paid for all the research. So an interesting thing happened again though. That summer that I was, my, my Harvard time was over, the group I was in was basically being cut. And so my boss told me, hey, we can't hold you to this agreement because it wouldn't be very fair because you're, you know, the job you would come back to doesn't exist. So if, if you like, you know, we'll let you go and we'll even pay you severance. So I ran for the door like Usain Bolt, you know, and one phone call later I was a venture capitalist. So that, that's how it all happened. But the reason I, I took a long time to do the intro because I'm going to show you how we look at deals at Hambrick just to give you a sense. We're not in this short amount of time going to get to go super deep. But before I tell you how we do it, I think it's more important why, right? Why do we do this work? Yeah, okay, we want to make money. But that's, you know, making money is great. Don't get me wrong. But it was the feeling of responsibility because when, when projects fail, it's, it's not just money. You know, there's people and careers that either get lost or derailed or sidetracked. You know, there's more at stake I'm going to try to convince you of um, than just resource allocation, right? Although that is obviously critical too. So we're going to go into some of the more details here and, and I'm going to try to move a little faster through some of this. And if you have questions, just throw them out and interrupt me. If you don't like what I said, throw water at me or something. Um, I really, you know, I have an Asian grandma, so if you have an Asian grandma, you know that nothing this group can say is probably going to hurt my feelings. Um, they look nice, but don't be fooled. Uh, you know, you think we're fighting, but I think we're finally talking. Okay, so just <laughs> bring it on. Okay, our, our computing system's called MIS. Don't ask me what it stands for. It's a super geeky acronym. It's our little Watson. That's all. And we have a computing system, and it is super advanced. This is a multi-million dollar system that has been developing a surveillance infrastructure across the globe for the specific purpose of understanding markets the way no other fund or investor can, including corporates. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the, the tools. They're very self-evident once you see them why this is awesome. But I, I will admit it is awfully creepy how we do this. I, I swear it's all legal, but uh, I can't help but be a little creeped out even by my own invention. Okay. So this is all we're trying to do. And, and people hear, they hear, the meme goes like this. Oh, here's this guy, Thomas, who looks like he's 12. And he's got this algorithm that predicts success of startups, right? And everyone's like, that sounds like bullshit, right? <laughs> like, you know, I wish what we did was that cool. Unfortunately, it is way less cool, but still highly useful. All we're trying to do is bring actuarial science and data into an asset class that for some reason has not had it before. And it's amazing to me that I can stand up in front of a, a sophisticated group like this and say that with total confidence. Right? Every insurance company is just managing risk, right? quantifying risk and managing it. They have actuaries and they have for a few thousand years. Right? This is normal. Every big asset management firm hires quants. Why? Because they quantify and manage risk. If your superannuation fund was just going on investments based on their gut feel about the CEO, you would be freaked out and you'd move your money somewhere else, right? So it's just, it's, there's quant. It's not that quant decides everything, but you'd be a fool to do it without some statistics. When you look at this entire asset class of corporate innovation, venture capital, M&A, going back to you know, Thomas Edison or however far back you want to go, there's never been any sense of actuarial science or statistics in this domain. And it's an asset class allocating resources to create growth, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and we could have another beer later and talk about like, why, has, how, why has this been a stats-free zone? Um, I have some theories. I'm not sure how solid they are. But it is amazing. It's more amazing that nobody's doing this, uh, as opposed to that we're trying to do this and have made a little progress in our own effort. So I, one of the challenges I want to throw out to you is, you know, the next time you watch Shark Tank and, and you see them sitting there hearing a pitch and going, yeah, I like that one. I'm going to put in some money. Realize that that's just a feeling that they had about a person. And so they thought they'd take a go, right? Which is fine if you've got a little pocket change and you don't mind losing it. But as a responsible asset class, I think that's a, that's a systemic problem. Um, and nobody likes math. I don't even like math. But sometimes you have to eat your vegetables, too, uh, in order to grow more healthy. Right? So that's all I'm trying to do. That's my entire soapbox in a nutshell. Um, so here's how we use MIS, our computing system, in the first person. Instead of Shark Tank, hearing a bunch of pitches, making a decision, maybe doing a little DD afterwards, um, 
what we do is we'll look at every company in a space, and MIS, our, our system is capable of seeing who's winning, and, and the right size given the kind of investment we want to do. Now, we like early stage small stuff with high growth potential, but you, you have different criteria amongst the people in this room. But for me, I can dial in and say, okay, let's look at genomics today, or let's look at cybersecurity today. Let's look at that chart that he just put up of all those cybersecurity companies. If I want to invest in some of them, I want to put them all out there. I want to harvest a truckload of data, see the ones that are winning, and start the conversation with those 10, not those 4,000, right? Because there's very few real blockbusters in any sample. So I got to go straight to them. So we find out who's already winning. That puts us at a good start, right? And that's all automated. Then we take the winners, maybe a dozen or however many, maybe there's three or five, and we do a much deeper, different kind of computing analysis, which is an actuarial analysis that tells us a specific risk for that company achieving our goals, which might be different from yours, given the realities in their market, the competitors, the economics, the whole meal deal. We can compute that um, and, and, and very, with very high accuracy figure out what that deal specific risk is for our fund. So first, we, we start with companies that are already winning, then we figure out, do they have those deeper causal indicators that are correlated with our goals? And only then will I call them and say, hey, I've done this analysis of your company. We're a venture fund. Uh, we're in the top, by the way, our fund, Hembrick Ventures, um, we're, we're somewhere in the top 5% in terms of returns. So it, it, performance is spectacular. You know, we're, we're doing very well. We'd love to talk to your company. Are you raising money? And that's usually a pretty easy conversation. So we don't sit there and take meetings. Um, you know, Sequoia, Kleiner, Mark Andreessen, all these great investors, if they want to see a thousand companies, they have to have a thousand meetings. And think about it, and form a thousand gut feelings about those meetings and build a portfolio around it. I mean, that would take at least a year, right? I mean, a thousand meetings, that's one every you know, hour or two, right? Whereas we can run a thousand companies in an afternoon, figure out the top 10 and go approach them. And we can turn that around in a few days. So we're going to show you what that looks like. But step three is important. So once we've figured out a company has the odds we're looking for, then we talk to them and we do regular DD. That's step three. And we do that the same as everybody else. It's qualitative. We ask things, you know, do we even like the founder? You know, everything is fair game. It, do we believe in it? All that good stuff comes in. But we don't waste our time doing DD on deals that have terrible odds. So our accuracy and efficiency is through the roof. And that's what's exciting about this, right? And it's, that's why I think this is a quest worth doing, because we have to innovate and, and allocate at the speed of real change in a real world. And we can't have 1,000 one-on-ones and efficiently get there. But we can if we can use AI and automation. So we'll give an example. Here's a company, a real company, Apnex Medical. Don't Google them, or you'll ruin it for yourselves. OK, <laughs> I'm warning you. No, uh, see the Asian grandma thing? Um, by the way, we don't reward accomplishment. Like my wife is uh, this beautiful Anglo gal, right? And her family rewards accomplishment. My family just punishes failure. So that's how it's different. That's the cultural gap. OK, but thank goodness she's better with the kids. Um, Apnex Medical, it's an implant, like a pacemaker that stops you from snoring. Right? And, and as you know, probably severe hypertension uh, has all kinds of comorbidities that, that can happen. When your organs and your brain are supposed to be regenerating at night, they're actually being deprived of oxygen, um, and it can lead to all kinds of serious things uh, over time. So here's a, a compelling need. There, there's more evidence that sleep apnea is, is an epidemic issue. It's, um, severe is a little smaller than that, but still, it's a big deal. Uh, this was founded by the former president of Boston Scientific Cardiology, one of the you know, top companies in this field. Top VCs. Tons of credibility, lots of money. So you see companies like this probably all the time. You get those emails from colleagues, hey, look at this company. And you, you say to yourself, I don't have time to look at that company. <laughs> right? But what if you really had to look at this company? Not as a venture capitalist, because probably very few of you are venture capitalists, but as a possible acquisition or a licensing partner or a marketing partner or a supply chain vendor or a distributor. You know, if there was any reason that you might have to spend some time on this com company to get some opinion of whether it's worth any more time, just, you know, we all know what that feels like. It's like, oh, geez, well, I guess I better read all their stuff. I, I, maybe if I can talk to them, that would be good. Um, if I know any smart colleagues who know a lot about hypertension and implants, I should probably call them. Maybe my friends from high school, like, hey, Bob, I, you're a doctor. Let me talk to you about this. You know, we, we have to rack our brains to figure out, is this something interesting or not? 
And that can take a long time. And once we make our minds up, we have to convince our colleagues, don't we? And that can, that can be even harder sometimes. At our fund, what we do, we pull up all the competitors in this category, whether not just implants, but also CPAP machines, oral appliances, which are mouth guards, you know, whoever else is solving this whole snoring problem, we pull them up. And we can see the orange line is how big or small all of those competitors are. And we generate that themselves, because these companies are not disclosing data, typically. So this is not data that's being disclosed. This is data that our bots are crawling for on the web to bring to us that nobody else can see. Typically, we see more about the companies than they see about themselves. The orange line is basically how big or small the companies are. The blue line is how much they're growing or shrinking. That's the short version. So Apnex Medical is so small. We can't even see an orange bar, right? It's imperceptible. It's tiny. And it's what little size it has, it's shrinking at an alarming rate. So that tells me I am not going to spend one more minute of time on Apnex Medical. I'm going to move on. However, if I'm really passionate about sleep apnea, I happen to notice these companies who I've never heard of that are doing really well. <laughs> so Apnex, sorry. But I really want to meet, you know, I'm an early stage guy, so I like little companies. So I probably want to talk to ZenGuard or SnoreRx. My guess is AirSense is a little, probably too big for me. But you can look instead at the little guys that are growing, because we know right away that, you know what, Apnex has great people. They might be super nice and super smart. But for some reason, they're, they're basically in decline and in distress. And they're probably going to fail. And that's something that we can do at scale that no other fund can do. So now you're starting to see why I don't have to have 1,000 meetings. And we can go straight. Now, if a year from now, Apnex comes back, and for whatever reason, they've moved up the list, well, OK, maybe I'll look at Apnex next year, but not now, because these are bad signs. Um, and it's not the most compelling use of my time and resources. So this is what cheating looks like. Right? Of course we're winning. We're cheating. We can go to the companies that are already winning and talk to them. And we don't have to meet all the other companies that aren't. So that, that's the holy grail right there. We'll give you some more examples. So obviously, if you want to invest or partner or license or supply, to, you know, if you want to create any relationship with the ones that are growing, here's 293 digital health companies, just whatever, an example. You, know, you can see who's winning. Um, however, we're finding companies like this audience are just as interested in the decliners. Because as a venture guy, I have a very simple mandate. It's really pretty bonehead. It's just find grower, invest. It's like, that's it. You know, find food, eat it. Whereas you have a much more diverse menu. You have strategic interests. You, you're not just looking for what I'm looking for. And companies, you know, for example, if some of the decliners, if Apnex Medical had great talent and great intellectual property, and you were one of their competitors, you might buy them because you can see they're in distress, and you get them an incredible discount. So sometimes there's gems hiding in the companies that are declining. And you know they're in declining, but nobody else knows that. So you have an in information asymmetry that gives you an advantage as an investor. And we're finding, too, some of the companies we work with and, and share R&D collaborations with around our computing system, you know, they love this list, right? They go, oh, yeah, I love these lists, Thomas, because whenever we talk to these decliners, they're so happy to take our phone call. It's like they're, they're, so, they're all smiles. They want to meet with us. You know, go figure. You know, they're, they're hoping you will save them. Um, and it makes for a very favorable environment for a deal. So, so whichever side or somewhere in the middle you're looking at at any particular day, this tells you how that industry is being played out right now. And we can look at this, you know, we can look at it every week, every month, whenever we want to see how it's changing. Other things you get to see are deeper insights into the markets just by seeing the winners and the losers and figuring out what the winners and losers have in common. So for example, here's a bunch of 3D printing companies. A company we work with is uh, one of the market leaders for the extrusions, the, the stuff that comes out of a 3D printer and hards, hardens. Oops, we have a PowerPoint issue, but OK. But you can see what, what they found is a lot of the companies in distress were hardware focused. Whereas a lot of the companies that were growing really fast were these really silly websites where even your kids could go and play with a cup online, modify it, and order it, and it shows up at their house. So you know, unit, volume of one kind of things. And what this company realized is this told them hardware is commoditizing, and the value has shifted to services. So instead of making harder industrial scale steel-like plastic extrusions, they need to figure out how to make these low mix, high volume, even if they're softer. but commercial other types of single unit extrusions instead, because that's where the margins and growth has moved. 
So those are all the kinds of things you get to see once you know how a market is laid out. Um, and that's the fun thing that you just can't do any other way. So for those of you here in corporate that are trying to innovate, um, you know, as a CFO, you, you've seen funnels probably for innovation groups. And you've had the unenviable job of deciding how much should I invest in this group. They're all telling me they're going to find the next Google. And they all have a process. But I know and they know, you know probably you know, 10 years from now, 80% of that stuff is going to fail. Right? So how do, we, how do I invest? How do I steward resources appropriately? It's a portfolio problem for us. Whereas for other people, they see it as a project problem because they're on one project. But looking across the umbrella, how can we use these kinds of insights? So here's a great example. Here's a company. We've sanitized it. This is a, one of the best innovators. You know, any top 10 innovation list worldwide, you'll see this brand. It's, it's very well known. And everybody looks up to them as the gods of innovation. Right? But under the hood, you know, they, they, people from all over the company can su submit proposals. Now, these are for corporate innovations, innovation projects, like the ones you're being asked to fund all the time. Out of all those proposals, they have an investment committee. 36% get qualified, which means you can keep looking. 26% you know, get a tiny amount of budget just to poke around a little deeper. If you look good at that point, you get um, you know, usually a quarter million to half a million dollars to, to do this MVP lean startup thing. And that's actually a pretty well-funded lean startup. But they get to look around, pivot, learn all that wonderful stuff to really lock in what is that business model. And if they're successful, they can apply for launch funding which now we're talking up to 20 million a year. Now this is go time, right? It's execute, commercialize, scale. And when I talked to this company, I said, well, okay, how often is your process, you know, what are the results of this process? And the company wasn't sure. So we said, okay, well, let's figure this out together. So after we, we talked to them for a long time, they went back and researched and found that 40% of these launch businesses, the ones that went all the way through the funnel, 40%, they shut down because, you know, it just didn't work out. That happens sometimes. 36% of them graduated out of the incubator into a business unit, which was the goal. And then the business unit just shut them down, usually within 24 months. Because the business unit takes on the project, but it's not their baby. You know, they're like, well, you know, I didn't birth you, and I'm going to cut you because there's other things I did birth, and I'm going to move my, you know, the projects die. 8% of them were spun out, always at a fire sale, always a loss of capital. 16% hit the goal, which is to graduate out of the incubator into the company and didn't die. So 16% of 4% was their success rate. The worst part is the reason this separate process was created was to find those billion dollar disruptors. Because all the little incremental innovations could be done in the core business. You don't need a separate bit. But, so these were rightfully for the big billion dollar moonshots. But when they looked at the 16% that actually survived, they were all incremental. No moonshots. And so this incubation group, after 20 years, was shut down not too long ago. Why? Because they couldn't answer a simple question. Where are all those billion dollar businesses you promised us? We have spent through the nose for 20 years. And all you've got is these little tiny wins that we probably could have done anyway, more cost effectively. So this is what can go wrong with all the best intentions. And what we need to figure out is not just at the project level, how do we analyze and pivot and look at things, but then at the portfolio level, what's the real value we're creating? How do we capture that value and make sure that the pipeline hits our growth objectives? And how do we quantify that? So it's not just about learning and creativity, but at the end of the day, we deliver real results. And so that's the kind of work that's been really fun to get involved with, too. right? And again. Um, so after we find a, a startup is doing really well and we want to invest, the step two, the next analysis, we, we just take some data about the company. Usually it's just what's on their website or, or if they have PowerPoint and we know them. But usually we take their website. And we build a huge data file using our computing system. And we pull in usually 10 to 20 million data points there about, um, about the product, about the customers, about the market. All this data that's a snapshot of the market they say they're in. And they might say they only have two competitors. We might find 52. Right? So, so we need to pull all that data ourselves. And then we put it into our, our simulation engine, which it's not a Monte Carlo, but it, th think of it as a Monte Carlo, where you put all these parameters in a piece of software. You hit Enter, and it just runs thousands of iterations. And you can see, oh, how often did this business win or lose or somewhere in between as a statistical matter? And 
What we found is that's predictive. It's, it's correct at predicting actual outcomes around two, two out of three, so around 66, 67% of the time. So that's a, a deeper but still highly automated and data-centric way of doing a second level before we even touch it as humans with regular due diligence, the hard and human way. Um, and the number, the results usually come out as a number, right? It's somewhere between zero and one. So, oh, this project has a 12% pr probability of hitting our goals, or a 61, or a, you know, where exactly is the risk? How do we quantify it? And then put together a portfolio of bets, accepting the risk, but that's engineered to deliver our result, even accounting for the risk, which is what actuaries do. And that's how this all comes together. And that's the fun part. I mean, it's super nerdy, but that, is, for me, is the most exciting thing. Because when I look at our portfolio, I know that even, there will be thrash, there will be loss, there will be things we can't predict. That is the way of the world. But given all that thrash, we're probably still going to hit our goals, just like a big insurance company. Because we understand how to game the risk so that we can at least accomplish what we really need to for our investors. So, not only is this possible, but this is what we've been doing for a decade, right? This is, um, it, it's not the, I'm trying to figure out, is this the beginning of this journey? I think it's, it's not the beginning, but it might be the end of the beginning. In other words, this capability exists. And the question is, what about in your organizations? How much money are you spending? And, uh, you know, maybe you can't go build our supercomputer, right? But, but can you, how can you begin to ask these questions and build a capability where you work to answer them. Because I hope I've convinced you that if you can't, you're still guessing. It looks good. It sounds good. You all sit there and make really smart arguments, but it's still guessing. And you can't outperform if, if you can't even figure out where the mean is and how to beat the mean, right? So that, that's, that's, the, that's the big message of today. Um, here's an example of a portfolio, projects A through P. Uh, the NPV of each project was put up in the middle there, the original value. But, and then over here, you're seeing what we found the probabilities of, of success, or really of that business hitting the goals of this portfolio, project to project. The goal, this portfolio in particular, had to deliver half a billion dollars in new growth, whatever that means, right? Um, and they realized that you know, after accounting for risk, they were only likely to deliver around 200 million. So they were going to miss their portfolio goals by about 60%. I mean, lots of you have seen this movie play out in the real world, right? And but what was nice is they could, by understanding the gap, what statistically, they could then change their portfolio, get some new projects, pivot other projects, cut some projects, until this number was 60, 650 million, which is what they did, because they re realized our algorithms have a 33% error margin, and they'd be damned if they didn't hit half a billion. So they knew their goal. They managed the odds to achieve it, accepting the risk that was probably going to happen as well. We're portfolio managers now. And that feels good. We're talking about early stage, little innovation, wild, disruptive stuff, where we can now quantify the odds, manage that portfolio. We can't predict the future, but we can understand risk. And, and we can shift from being the gambler, who's just betting and hoping, to being the casino, where we're calculating odds and gaming the whole thing to hit our goals. So that's what this actually looks like in practice. Here's the accuracy. I already talked to you about it. You know, when, when Mies predicts a business will survive, it's right two out of three, um, it, which means it's wrong a third of the time. And when it's wrong, it's totally wrong, which is the beauty of science. There's no arguing. You know, it said Tesla would fail. Tesla hasn't failed, so it was wrong, and that's okay. It's okay to be wrong. We've been wrong over a thousand times, right? Wrong is fine as long as we accept it and improve. Now, obviously, when Mies is pessimistic and predicts a business will fail, it looks really accurate, but that's because around 85% of businesses fail, period. So as CFOs, if you just always say no to every project, in hindsight, you'll be right around 85% of the time. So your I told you so value is amazing. But you only make money when you say yes, and it works. So OK, just FYI, right? Um, now, obviously, when you combine these two columns and say, what is this computing system's total accuracy? The total accuracy is 81%, but that's BS, right? It's totally skewed by the artificial, you know, the high number of failures in innovation context. So when I, when I want people to remember what this system can and can't do, I want to set expectations. It's right two out of three. I think that's the clean. Real understanding, it, it's not higher, it's not lower. I think that's the right expectation. And that's what we've been seeing in the real world, too. 
All I'll say about this chart, because we're almost out of time, these are returns in a portfolio. Um, basically, Mies, in this case, caught every project over 200% returns. It doesn't always catch all the big winners. It's not 100% all the time. But we found that it's really good at figuring out which projects are going to be huge successes or huge failures, where we see most of the error cluster is around zero. Projects that end up being sort of that walking dead kind of, eh, you know, the, those ones. So that's where we see the error cluster. But thankfully, that's enough to build a portfolio around. I mean, in this case, if you just take the same 80 deals, let's pretend you couldn't go outside of that circle of deals. By just having fewer crappy deals, this portfolio, which did very well, would have had a 3x higher return. 3x, just by having, you know, it's a ratio, right? So if you just get rid of the crappy deals, that's another way to improve your returns. Um, but that's also how you avoid allocations that cost people their jobs. So, so that's an important way to understand this. So, so this is the whole song and dance. I'm about out of time. But I, I started this talk with why this matters to me, personally. But I, I, I want to keep pushing the point. And I think you already know the point. But I want to make it anyway. And this is why it matters, right? Once upon a, upon a time, Detroit was you know, looked up to by the world. Now, not so much. And the only difference between then and now, it wasn't the number of doctors or nonprofits or politicians or lawyers or it was just three companies failed, just three. Right? The three big car companies failed, and this happened. That's it. So somewhere in the top of the corporate offices of three companies, there was a misallocation of resources on growth innovations that took an entire city to a place it may never come back from. We hope that it does. But that's how much power our decision making has over the communities that our companies touch. And it's, it's amazing that if I think of Ford or General Motors back then, I'm just imagining those were the smartest people on earth doing the very best that they could. But they didn't have the tools to see beyond what they could see. And, and we all know the consequences. However, if you do it right, here's Nepal's per capita GDP and North, uh, South Korea's once upon a time. And then here it is today. So not only can choices take you down, but the right choices sometimes can lift you up. I mean, one Google in Nepal would completely change the entire country. It would probably quintuple the country's GDP. So that's, that's the opportunity for getting it right and a reminder of the cost for getting it down. And I think that's a very real, as someone who's had to help lay off real human beings, to me, that's a very personal and non-abstract concept. Mm -hmm.